All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listener. Uh, good afternoon, Lenny. My name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the students in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Lenny Zakatek accepted our invitation to the show. Lenny, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good, man. And you always start with the same question. The last two years have been very difficult with with COVID and traveling. And if you are a touring musician like yourself, you couldn't go to many places. Huh? How you how you make it up? How you holding up, man? Uh, it's sorry, I gotta do this. Okay, I'm fine now. Um, it's been yeah, it's been tough because England was pretty strict. You know, it was in and out. So uh, I was actually um, in Pittsburgh recording uh, 2019, 2020, I think around that time when I had to leave America because they were shutting down the borders. Otherwise, I'd have still been in the states for two years. Wow! Uh, so I, I got myself out on the Friday and on, on the Sunday, Trump closed down the the airways. So I, I got out just in time. Um, so yeah, it's been, initially it was okay. You know, we're just sitting around, couldn't see family, uh, um, which was tough for us. Uh, and just walking in the hills of Purley where I live in Surrey in England. Um, but, um, but then it, it started to get, um, you know, you couldn't do anything musically. You, you couldn't meet people. Um, we we found it pretty tough, you know, really really tough. Uh, yeah. So not nothing creative happened. Uh, I did manage to, because I, I was working also with my Italian brothers in in uh, in Bergamo, where the pandemic first started, and uh, I'd done two shows uh, with uh, the Sky Band and uh, the Gavazzini Orchestra. Um, so. Halfway through COVID, I decided to um, record um, an Alan Parsons song called Don't Answer Me. But I got uh, guys from Local Harm to play on it and some of the Alan Parsons Project uh, original players played on it. Um, and I got got on board Bonnie Tyler and uh, George well, McRae. You know, yeah, Mr. Good for you. So, yeah, they... <laughs> I kept saying, okay, guys, send me your vocal. I've done the backing track. You know, it's done. It's so, re you know, everybody was ready to go. And George was living in Aruba. So he had his studio in Aruba. Uh, Bonnie was living in Portugal because when COVID happened, she had a house there. So they were in their lovely studios. I was in my kitchen in, in London. <laughs> so my vocal is on, a, on an iPhone. I'm singing. That's the deal. I'm singing my vocal. You have to put that on your show. I will. I'm singing my vocal. Don't answer me. <laughs> and George is coming out of his studio, and he's still complaining. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> quality's yeah. not right. And uh, Bonnie did a great job, um, and the Italian guys sang on it and stuff like that. So uh, it was great. So I felt great because it took about almost three months to put together. So it took up some of the time from you know that we had in COVID, but. It was tough, really tough, I think. Yeah, you know? yeah no, I, I, I know what you mean, man. You were born in Karachi, right? In British India, under yeah. the name of Lenny Duplatel. You know, feel yeah. free to elaborate. My all my questions are open ended. So for you to I'm a like I'm a I'm like a psychologist. I ask questions, people <laughs> people get back to me, whatever they want. So uh, tell us a little bit about your childhood if you can remember be, before you moved to the, the UK. Well I lived I lived in India it um well, it was India when I was born, and then it became Pakistan. Yeah, uh, and it was it was lovely uh, for a while. Um, my my father was a, a top policeman out yeah. there. Uh, my background is Anglo Indian, so we're a mixture of English and Indian, or English, French, and Indian, depending on who who came over to the country and That's visited right. yeah. our, our women. So. Uh, um, yeah, a similar background to Engelbert Humperdinck and Cliff Richards, and actually Freddie Mercury had the same kind of background uh, life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we would um, uh, we were quite musical. Uh, my um, my uncle Jerry played harmonica. Sorry, my dad played harmonica. Jerry played trumpet. So usually, if there was parties, we'd all gather around, the, you know, the guitars or the piano and. We were almost uh, requested <laughs> to, you know, seven and eight years old to, to sing something at the parties. So that's, uh, uh, my life was, yeah, pretty full on. I went to a grammar school there, second language, French, third language was sort of Latin. Can't remember it now, but um, 
um, had a good education out there. It was a good life. You know, we were very lucky uh, to live that life. But then it started to get a little dangerous for certain groups of people. So uh, we decided as Anglo-Indians to, to leave. Uh, and most of the Anglo-Indians left um, Karachi and, and even parts of India to the Commonwealth, you know, Canada, New Zealand, Australia and England. So, uh, so I came over in the, in the 60s. Uh, I was 13 at the time. Uh, and, um, you know, the housing wasn't great as the stuff that we had back there. You know, we had a, a really lovely lifestyle. So my parents gave up quite a lot for us to, to leave there and then come to, to UK. Um, yeah, UK was tough initially, as it would be, you know, uh, when you're coming from another country. But uh, it kind of gave me an inspiration because we were musical. So I formed a band and called the Trailblazers with yep. uh, with my friend. Uh, my cousin was playing bass. My uncle was a trumpet player who was, I think he was about 32 and I was 14. So he was teaching me to play guitar up in the bedroom. Yep. And uh, instead of learning what I wanted, he would teach me the great songs, you know, Masquerade, George on the Mind, Left My Heart in San Francisco, and songs that my parents would be singing, you know? So, uh, I learned a lot of great songs in, in those early years. So my, my roots were um, kind of bluesy, but, you know, uh, classical songs. Uh, so uh, uh, so we formed the Trailblazers. And even at that age, I think my first gig, I was 15, where we weren't allowed to go into the pub. So we had to go around the back, stay on the stage. And then when we finished the gig, my dad would pick us up and we'd leave. But we weren't allowed to going to the place that served alcohol. That's right. So, you were very young, man. Uh, right. yeah. Too young. but uh, And we formed our own little club as well called the Trailblazer Club in um, in a place called Broad Green. There was a club there. Called, it wasn't a club. There was a pub there called the Star, the Star Pub. And they had a lot of uh, later bands like uh, the Yardbirds, the Animals. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it was a nest of, uh, you know, where... The, the sort of blues orientated clubs. Uh, um, Chris Farlow was there. Um, you, you should look him up. He's one of, one of the, the big blues singers that came out of the UK in those days. Uh, and then from we we went from there to little little shows, uh, you know, but mainly pub orientated. The money was, you know, Monday night you got ten pounds. No, Monday night you auditioned. <laughs> Wednesday night you got ten. Thursday night you got fifteen. So I did one audition and then the guy called us up and said, I've got a gig for you next Monday night. I said, ah, we're not doing that. We, we're going straight to Thursday, you know, for 15. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, and then we started doing Saturday nights because all the young audience were following us, you know. So, uh, and, and that was a good good bedrock for me to to start before I went to Germany at 17 and yeah. uh, played mainly at the American sort of blues circuit and the, the clubs that the... American army was frequenting, you know. Yeah. You knew back then, I don't know, you were 15, 16, making some money, that music was your scene, it wasn't any family pressure to say, well, go to school, you go to university, forget about music, you will never make any money, it's a difficult life. No, you... my my dad saw me often, and uh, when I came to that point at 16, where well, I had to take my exams, um, the GCSEs that we had at the time, and then go on to college. Um, I said I wanted to be a musician, and the, I remember the discussion at home. And uh, I, because I was leader of the band, and I was getting the gigs as well at the same time, you know. So uh, I, they were happy that I really knew what I was doing, you know. Uh, and I went on to to prove to them that I I could do it because. Um, we auditioned for Radio London when I was 16 and a half. That was a pirate radio station. Um, and they just sent us a contract we signed. They didn't know what we signed. And then it said, you've got three months in Germany. I was 17. <laughs> so, um, but because my uncle was in the band and my, my cousin was older, it felt like a family thing. Sure. So as the trailblazers. So uh, they, uh, we, you know, we didn't have transportation. We had nothing really. But um, we got um, 
we got the gig and it was in a, a bar in Hanau in uh, South Germany. And it was a blues bar where it was frequented mainly, uh, I would say at the time, by American, Hispanics and, and, and black kids, you know, 19, about to be next, next stop Vietnam. So they were being trained in, in South Germany. Uh, but we didn't know that. We just thought, hey, we're going to Germany because the Beatles went there. You know, it's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw the Beatles. <laughs> Never saw the Beatles. Still, still looking for the Beatles. <laughs> they, were, they were gone. We yeah. were just hard knocks, man. We were playing, you know, in hard knocks. I mean, the, the gig, the guy really liked us. I mean, to get there, we didn't have any transportation, but a fan, fan of ours worked for the British Post Office. This is crazy. And he had this, these bands were called the Green Goddesses. It was the post office bands. Um, you should look up what a Green Goddess van looks like. Yeah, I need to check it out. <laughs> it does about, um, I don't know, 30 miles, 40 miles an hour, because that's all it's needed to do to deliver. And we were going to Germany <laughs> from London, crossing the, you know, the channel in this Green Goddess. Uh, and it was just, you know, uh, a huge van with no seating so the last gig we did at Gulliver's nightclub uh, there was some seating lying around in the back so we took the seating and put it into the van next morning loaded up the van and we we went and this guy had the weekend off with the van would you believe he was working for the British post office so we we took off to Germany and he said he, on this on the Sunday we got there on the Friday and we were working we were working the Monday um, so he he said, I've got to get back to work, man. So he took the van back and he went back to England. And we were there now with no transportation. So if we got thrown out of the gate, we had nowhere to go. So we had to make sure. <laughs> you guys were good. <laughs> we, were, we were good, yeah. So we went there with, because in the pubs, we kind of did two 45-minute sets. And that was that was the deal, you know, in those days. But in Germany, it was they were like hard, edged blues clubs and he said um you know sunday he gave us a meal and coffee and stuff like that and we had this little apartment and then uh he said come in monday we talk because monday was a kind of dead day there but we still had to work uh so he said oh tonight just you know play we see how many how many people are going to be here etc uh but the deal is uh by the weekend you have to be playing starting at eight you do 45 minutes, 15 minutes off, right the way to four o'clock in the morning, eight, eight, 45 minute sets. So it was, I mean, at 17, it was tough, you know. Uh, so we, we kind of thought about songs we had played before and how, how do we, you know, and we were doing a mix of British pop. We want, and a few soul things, you know, doing Hard Day's Night by the Beatles and then Georgia on my mind and Rescue Me. And it was a real mix of stuff. But when we saw the audience coming, we thought we better get our shit together here. Yeah, so. <laughs> I God. mean, you know, those those uh, soldiers, you know, they were they were away from the world, as they called it, because the world was America to them. Yeah. And they started giving us uh, um, little forty fives, you know, or peep, Joe Tex and uh, Boogaloo Down Broadway by Johnny C and. Uh, stuff from Rita and a bit of James Brown and we'd never heard of this stuff. We'd heard a bit of it, but not, you know. So we, we literally, we were learning new songs and playing them on the night uh, and extending solos and stuff just to get through the first the first week. Uh, but by the end of the month, I mean, we had we had eight hours down, you know, I mean, we knew which spots to kick into and which spots to chill off and, you know, play some stuff. And people would come and request and Quite often, um, at that period, uh, you get guys that were drafted and they were musicians, you know. I mean, I remember singing duets with this guy called Craig, uh, the most beautiful voice, but he had a better voice than mine. Uh, and he, his next stop was Vietnam. And, you know, so they were in, in those kind of uh, four-piece harmony bands, you know, back in LA or Chicago or whatever. Uh, so we... Sometimes they'd sit in on our rehearsals and say, "No, you should do that, man, because that chord sounds better." You know, that's wow. that's the real thing. Yeah, that's the real thing. You know, yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, so wherever we went in Germany, some of these this, these fans, um, American soldiers would follow us, and then and then rock up and and come and sing. You know, we we do duets with them and stuff like that. Some some guy would play guitar, some guy would uh, play piano, and you just step in, and you knew if you know Bob came in, he was going to come and play. Um, Mustang Sally with you, you know what I mean? And if somebody else came and he did, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, the um, Jimmy, what's it, Ramsey Lewis trio and stuff like that, you know, he'd come up and say, I, I play that song only and I only play it in C. You know, That's can't right. Play it in you know, so, different. Did you ever, were you able to save any money or it wasn't enough to? No, no, well, it was great. We, we got, um, I mean, we were obviously getting better than the national wage in the UK at the time. So, uh, we saved our money that first month, uh, and we bought ourselves. Um, the equipment was ours, but we were on the Never Never Simon. It's like high purchase, you know, yeah. playing monthly. So our parents would pay the bill while we were away, and then when we came back, we'd go into the the, the record store uh, and pay for our guitars and our keyboards and whatever. Uh, yeah. um, but um, yeah, we bought a van. We bought a uh, VW combo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, so, you weren't doing it right. <laughs> you weren't doing okay. You know. Well, it was second hand. It was second hand. Uh, and we drove that back to the UK because after right. after three months, um, we uh, we came back because we it was a three month contract. Um, so the second month we were playing in an, in an officers club in Darmstadt. We left Hanau, but we loved Hanau because we we just grew to love so many people from from germans to americans you know that were our age and it was just but darmstadt was literally 30 miles away so a lot of the audience from from that that area used to come to see us but we played we didn't know that the uh the deal on the contracts were that if if the club didn't like you um or, or your sound they had three days to make up their mind and then they can fire you so in Darmstadt, it was an officer's club. And uh, we started with this big soul set. And uh, we found that it, the officer's club was a country club. It was a country and western club <laughs> with a totally different audience. Of course. So yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. And I, I won't say what the, uh, the promoter of that club said to us when they fired us because it was a word you got it was the n-word but basically it was uh, mm, uh we we won't have any n-word music here tonight and they fired us so we went back to the the army barracks of our friends in in Hanau and uh, we parked up in the car park and the army let us stay there and then uh we used to go into the barracks when the of you know the the guards weren't around and wash up and and then go back and sleep in the van and the the, the guys there would feed us and bring us stuff from the canteen <laughs> yeah and we did a month there sleeping in the van and we got a few local german gigs yeah know, but we were there on our own 17 18 years old in a car park so that that shows you whether you want to do it or not really Absolutely, that exactly. That show you if you if you're made from the government. I my understanding is that singer Alicia De Paul play an important role in your life, and uh, feel free to elaborate on that. How? Say that again. Uh, my understanding is uh, Lindsay De Paul play oh, a, yeah, an yeah, important yeah. role in your life. With uh, well, I think you got yeah, a very good single like "I Got You Now," "Get Your Gun." Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. She well, um, I I didn't think the music was great that we did together if i'm honest uh but the break was good because she got me signed to bell records uh which had tony orlando you know tie yellow ribbon around the old oak tree and uh a few other things like uh aquarius yeah uh, fifth, fifth dimension so i was in good company it was an american label she got me signed to a um, young man called dick leahy who went on to publish all the George Michael stuff, and uh, uh, he actually opened the label uh, that had uh, Billy Ocean on it, Donna Summers, etc. So, wow. uh, 
uh, you know, for that reason. But uh, I go, I was playing a, a nightclub called Gulliver's where um, I had a residency there. And the downstairs was a jamming place where people like um, the Supremes and Stevie Wonder and all used to come if they were ever in town. That was a late night place they used to come to. Um, so while I was in the residency, Lindsay DePaul walked in one night with uh, Dudley Moore. Do you know Dudley Moore? The jazz pianist. He's a comedian. Yeah, he yeah, I think I heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was in the movie 10, which was uh, fantastic. So they came in and his musical year said, that guy's good. That was me. <laughs> I was still pretty young. But Lindsay got me signed to Bell Records uh, with, uh, and she was a friend of Harvey Goldsmith, the big entrepreneur who was, right. later became the big entrepreneur and did Live Aid and stuff like that. So, but Harvey really wasn't a manager, but he was, he was about 24. I, I think I was about 22 and we were just all kids together. Um, right. And next minute, I'm going to Strawberry Studios in Manchester. Wow. Uh, and which which belonged to 10 CC. But I think if I'm wrong, they were called Neanderthal Man or something before the name 10 CC. You might have to look that up. I need to look that up, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but uh, so we we went to Strawberry Studios and um, some of the guys from 10 CC played on the played on the track, uh, because part of the deal was you know, you use our studio, we play. Um, so um, and Lindsay was amazing, she she pulled that off. Uh the only thing was she was a pop writer and I was a little more of a soulful, you know, um, I wanted to kind of sing soul really, uh, sure. but I didn't know. I mean, I was convinced because, and so was Dick Leahy about uh, the direction I was going in. So uh, we, yeah, we had a couple of great records out um, together and uh, the, the Get Your Gun got released in Germany uh in german i sang that in german as well cool. really cool wow. yeah it was they changed the i had to sing rotaman which means red man as opposed to get your gun because it was a bit political that's right uh, uh so i sang that in german i don't think my german was very good but the singing was okay <laughs> so uh, actually uh, i've got a cd here somewhere i should really send you i'll send you a picture of it yeah that would be because, yeah I didn't don't want to interrupt this and we're just uh, decorating one of the rooms and all my CDs have been um, my vinyl have been stored. <laughs> so, I, 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 I understand. I understand. Uh, after that, you joined the band Gonzalez, right? After that, yeah. Well, the the, the drummer of Gonzalez was Glenn Lafleur, who uh, uh, was in a band called Slim Chance, which was the band. Ronnie Lane Slim Chance, which was the band that used to back Rod Stewart. Uh, so he was the drummer with that band. And he was also uh, in, oh God, I'll get the names soon. He was in, in a couple of really good uh, funk based, you know, early funk based bands in the UK that uh, um, that made made pretty, you know, success of, of their, their music. Uh, he had joined Gonzalez and um, uh, he had he'd left the band to join Gonzalez and we had another drummer and we, we carried on working in Italy and other places. But when I came home, he gave me a call one night and he said to me, uh, I've got a I've got a gig you should come and see. I'm in this great band called Gonzalez and it's 13 piece, five horns, percussion, oh, wow. two guitars. Yeah, great. So I went, yeah, OK. Um, so. And he said, our singer is leaving. So I said, who's your singer? And he said, well, Carl Douglas is our singer. And uh, he's just recorded a song called Kung Fu Fighting. So he's gone. <laughs> so, you know, he's making money. <laughs> We're not making money. He's making funny. money. Yeah. You know, he, Carl, was a, Carl was had a great voice. He was a bit like Marvin Gaye type of voice, but he wrote Kung Fu Fighting. So he was gone. Uh, <laughs> so they didn't have a singer. So I, I rocked up to the speakeasy one night and they say, what do you know? And I said, Isley Brothers, love the one you're with. Uh, and I can sing, you know, a bit of blues and show me what you, what you guys do. But it was mainly an instrumental band, you know, because of the, the size of the horns. And by yeah. the time every guy in the band did the solo, the show was over. You know? That's <laughs> so right. Yeah, it was two hours now. <laughs> Here's the trombone player. You know? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I went up and sang and they said, we went back to the dressing room after the gig. 
they gave me two C90 tapes and said, learn them, learn the songs. Uh, I was lucky because there was a lot of instrumentals in there and there was, and he said, if you know any stuff you want to sing. So I recommended, I can't remember which, but I recommended some stuff to them. Uh, and he said, the gig's on Friday. I went, okay. So I hadn't had a rehearsal with them. I just knew I had to get my stuff together. You heard, and, you heard uh, the music, yeah. And the first gig we did uh, was Birmingham Odeon to about 2,000 people. And as we rocked up, it was Gonzalez supporting Bob Marley and the Whalers. My God, man. Wow. And I went, good God. <laughs> um, but prior to that, what we didn't know was um, two of uh, two of the Marley band had come to uh, uh, check us out at, at the speakeasy. Uh, and uh, they said, can we, can we sit in with you? And it was the drummer and the bass player. Yep. And uh, you just knew by the way he went, you know, the rhythm was there, the bass played, and the band just followed, you know, with little horn stabs and stuff like that. It was just unbelievable. And then uh, and then we didn't hear anything. We we thought we kind of knew, maybe we knew the guys from somewhere, but we weren't sure. And then we got a call from EMI uh, to say, um, Bob Marley would like you guys to support their, their tour. Um, and we did five nights at Hammersmith Odeon in London. Uh, yeah. we, it was the first band ever to do five straight gigs in one show. You know, now they do that. That's but right, in those yeah. days, it, right, you yeah. did one gig and you went on. So the, we did five nights in Hammersmith. Place was just rocking. But I mean, Molly, his sound checks were three hours. You know, he was just jam. I mean, he, I think he wrote jamming while he was sound checking. You know, because it was just with jamming. You know, and with, with, and we're thinking, when are we gonna get our sound check? <laughs> yeah, three hours. Wow. Yeah. When you're that young. Know, yeah, I mean, you know, he'd be in there from two in the afternoon sound checking, and our sound check was maybe you know five thirty to six, uh, yeah. and then doors yeah. open, and quite often we would think, are we going to get a sound check tonight? You know what I mean? Because, um, and a lot of people say, a lot of people say to me, uh, did you feel that he, you know, Marley was great? And yes, he was. But when you're that young. At the time, you think, yeah, we can, we can do this. You know what I mean? We we can be the biggest band in the world because every every band feels that, doesn't they? You know, when you when you're that young. But That's right. he was unbelievable. I mean, his the grooves, the, the timing of his vocals. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. And then the, but the, they ask you to be opening the the gigs from them. But besides the five gig, you you go other countries in Europe as well, or just in the UK? You... With Molly, no, we. Uh... We did Portsmouth Football Ground and we did, I think we did Cardiff Arm Park in, in Wales. And then we did the one in Birmingham. Uh, yeah, no, we just did UK. I think uh, initially um, I heard a story from one of the labels that because nobody knew Marley in, in well, the, the media and the industry didn't know Marley as such. You know when when the Island Records first came out. So one of the reasons for using Gonzalez because we were uh, there was these news newspaper called the Evening Standard, which was big in London, and we were Evening Standard Band of the Year. We were College Band of the Year. You know that sort of stuff. So they'd done their research and they probably thought we could help sell tickets. <laughs> when That's you're right. thinking about it, yeah, you know, help sell tickets for Bob Marley, but they didn't need Gonzalez to sell tickets because the first night it was just rammed i mean it was just you couldn't there were people fighting outside to get in you know um, it was just crazy really crazy and that went on for five nights absolutely you know yeah. so uh yeah it was a it was a hell of an experience because we we used to open the show by each member walking on with an instrument you know and it usually started with the, the, the percussionist playing you know, yeah something cool and then the bass player walked on with boom, 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 the drummer, right? Yeah. And it was just chilled. And then when the, by the time the horn, the, the horn section came, ba -da 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 -da, and then ba -da, and the band just kicked. But that took about five, six minutes. And the first night with Molly, we were walking on before the singer came on, me. And by the time I walked on, 
they were booing, they were throwing shit at <laughs> you know, we won Mali, we won Mali. <laughs> so, because we took so long to come on. You know, That's like, right. So so I, I just chilled the band down. I started talking to the audience. I said, listen, you know, Messiah is here. You're going to hear him. Give us 30 minutes. We love him too, you know. That's right. Um, and I was winning him, winning him over saying, you know, we're good. Just give us a chance, you know. And we're, and we're British, you know. And uh, But Marley, we've heard him in rehearsal. You are going to get the best show of your life. You've never heard anything like this man is... Is Jesus, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I won him over with, with a bit of that, but yeah. I could see my, my time was limited, you know, if uh, somebody was going to come over and physically throw me off throw the you stage. Throw you out, out of the stage, man. <laughs> so I, I said, so I was looking at the band saying, cut the solos, you know what I mean? Just, just do all the gig and get off. So we did that. We, we played, I think we reduced 40 minutes to 30, saved our lives and went off. The next night, so we then discussed what the second night was going to be. And we said, listen, stop this cool stuff about walking on stage. Let's just go out there and go, bang, you know, hit him. Start dancing, start singing, get the the girls on stage moving with us. Yeah. Get the audience, you know what I mean? They okay. won't have, don't give them a chance to have a, even shout and scream, you know, get the F out of here. We will just hit him with sound. And when the screen opened, it was a kind of, very middle class white audience <laughs> the second night. <laughs> the first night were the fans, you know what I mean? The crazy yeah. people. And the second night was the people that say, I've got a CD of Bob Marley, don't you know? <laughs> it was one of those, you know, to be be in in the know. So right. it was a very, very kind of a chilled, sophisticated audience. So we thought, I wish we'd done the first show now. <laughs> so, That's right. But yeah. you, you know, you learn. And then after that, I mean, we used to play football football with Marley and stuff like that you know it was uh it was great uh he was lovely and they were but he was pretty private you know so that was that one yeah well well that, you know you were young very good experience Bob Marley fine eyes you know playing all over England uh, that was you know a good uh you know good experience for you and then uh Alan Parson came after that or is something in between no, uh, we, I gigged for many, many. I did about 2,000 shows with Gonzalez, you know, yeah. up and down, wow, yeah. everywhere in France. And just, we just traveled, you know. We didn't have, we didn't do tours as such. We just went out and gigged um, anywhere, everywhere. Because uh, we, we really felt in those days that we were going to, uh, you know, if we played enough and got discovered through that way it wasn't through social media and it wasn't through reality shows you just gigged and gigged and gigged and that's, that's right yeah the internet didn't exist were, back then or yeah and there were time. programs like uh all gay whistle test uh, which would have live bands on and stuff like that we were pretty close to getting on there because you had to earn earn the right to be on those shows you know in those days uh and then we i'd already recorded a lady called Gora Jones came into town. Uh, she had written Tainted Love for Soft Cell and uh, she had sung Tainted Love and she wrote I uh, Haven't Stopped Dancing Yet. And she went into EMI and she said she was looking for a band with, uh, um, you know, a guy with my kind of voice, I guess, and um, a band like Gonzalez. She wasn't sure. Uh, she said her... her her descriptor of what she was looking for, she was looking for a cute Hispanic kid, <laughs> which I'm not, uh, with a great rear end. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't oh, know if you man. can print that. I don't know <laughs> if you can print that. And I still joke with her about it. Uh, yeah. And um, I had a pretty good rear end in those days. And I had a cute, cute look, you know, the long hair. And I guess I could pass for multiracial Hispanic. Right. I'm angry, right. Um, and so we, we started to record Heaven Stop Dancing. She, she'd written Heaven Stop Dancing. We did a little bit to the middle eight you know, section, but it was like what Gonzalez would do, you know, percussion and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it did initially, it got to number one in the DJ sort of soul charts in England. Yeah. But Radio One, for some reason, wouldn't play it because they were playing Philly Sound in those days. And it was like, that's what they did. And they were quite stubborn with what they played they weren't very open with stuff uh they are now 
but um, so the EMI, it was on EMI as well, which some people felt was the wrong label to launch, you know, a disco and stuff. Um, so they they took the record off the market and uh, added some percussion uh, and Johnny Loango did the strings on it and stuff and mixed it. Uh, no, Paul Reiser did the strings. He later did some Stevie Wonder stuff and Johnny Loango mixed it. And, it was, and then it came out in America and it charted in America. It killed it. We did Soul Train and everything in America. We just absolutely killed it in America. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then what happened was it came, as, came to UK as an import and not as a British song, a British Weird. band. Yeah, yeah. So when we were doing Soul Train, because in those days, radio and TV was was quite diverse. It was like, you know, if you were a certain complexion, they played you, and if you weren't, they played you. It was, you know, I don't want to use the words. Yeah. But uh, Soul Train loved it, but they didn't want to put us on because there was a lot of white guys in the band, you know what I mean? And because we were a multiracial band. So we actually sent a picture of, Jake, the trombone player, who was West Indian origin, myself, Hispanic, I'm not Hispanic origin, and <laughs> um, <laughs> and Preston Preston Heyman, who was gorgeous looking man, uh, uh, played drums with Kate Bush later uh, as well, wow. and but he had Italian background. He just come off a holiday in Tunisia, so he was looking the right complexion for Soul Train. <laughs> so yeah. they sent pictures. They sent pictures of us, and uh, we still didn't get on the show visually, but they played the track, and, and you know, the, the great dancers on Soul Train and played it. And, uh, I mean, Studio 54 was playing it. My my sister was an air stewardess for Freddie Laker Airways, and she was in, in the phone booth putting money in, saying, have a listen. Yeah. <laughs> have a stop dancing, good. Uh, Studio 54 were playing it. So, wow. but we, we, we never saw any of that excitement because we were in the UK and we didn't know that it was blowing up in, in America. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if we, we did well in the UK and the rest of the world with it, you know? Um, so yeah. Um, exciting times. And why, why Gonzalez ended? It, it ended you, you left or, or well, kind of after I, that many years you, it wears off or? The, the, it was like a co-op band. There was no kind of leadership as, that I could see. You know, there was a couple of guys that would get the gigs and stuff. You know, Mick Eves was great at doing that. But we didn't have management, you know. Uh, we had a, a guy that managed Mark Bolden for a little while. But uh, they were just in there to strike the deal, get the percentages and, you know, part of the advance money and go. So there was nobody really developing us. Yeah. Uh, we were very much loved by Roger Ames, who was a, a EMI. He later went on to Warners and some, you know, stuff like that. But uh, there was no kind of direction, you know. Uh, we weren't hard to handle. We were just we just loved playing. So for I mean, for example, when we when Haven't Stopped Dancing broke in in the UK finally after the American success, uh, we got a tour with Tavares across uh, UK, yeah, uh, and uh, and at the same time. We were doing shows like in Newcastle, which is 300 miles from London. Uh, I remember Roger calling us <clears throat> from EMI and saying, I've got you Top of the Pops, you know, the biggest TV show in 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 Europe. Yeah. I said, great. He said, when is it? He said, Thursday. I said, oh, we can't do it because we're, we're doing uh, the, the Penthouse Club in Sheffield. <laughs> so, so, the true 300 people. He said, get your asses down here, otherwise you have no deal with EMI. So we literally did the show, drove down through the night, you know what I mean? Went straight, tired, you know, arrived at 10 in the morning, had a shower, went straight to the TV studio and recorded the song, you know? We, we weren't that organized. We were just for the love of the music, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and even the way they dressed us with Over the Pops, they took us down Carnaby Street, you know, the famous where the Beatles went in. And they started dressing us up like an uh, American four-piece band, you know what I mean? Harmony singers, you know, with suits. And, and we were like, you know, leather straps and waistcoats and shirt, you know, headbands. And, <laughs> That's right. You know, <laughs> we were like the, the Santana of, uh, of the, you know, of the UK. UK. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, uh, nobody had a special pair of shoes or shiny pants. <laughs> it was just jeans. And so uh, they took us to Garnaby Street and they couldn't dress the band because the band refused to, to wear anything. But they said, you guys up front, you need to look, you know, you need to look solid. So, yeah. so if you ever see that Top of the Pops video of me, I, I've got a pink satin suit on with a gold cummerbund looking, looking like, a four piece <laughs> nothing like you know i mean listen i i enjoyed the, the experience but when i look back on it it's just you know 70s pop and we weren't we was we were jazz funk soul band we had a That's residency right. at Ron, you know ronnie scott's nightclub which is you know buddy rich played there and the great jazz fraternity played there and we had a residency upstairs at ronnie scott so we were you know musicians first really but yeah wow unbelievable 2000 show man and then um uh, how you end up uh you know uh, let's go to the beginning of uh uh with alan parson you knew yeah, eric yeah. eric at the time yeah every one? time yeah two fans that we had that we found out later one was john deacon of queen we used to come yeah. down to the kids and uh and eric wilson yeah i think eric wilson may have published He knew Gonzalez even before me because he, I think he worked with Carl Douglas and may have published Carl Douglas' Kung Fu Fighting. Uh, so he was always around Gonzalez. He loved it. And uh, I was doing some demos at Manchester Square Studios uh, at EMI. They had a demo studio there. We used to go out and just record tracks. Uh, and I was there working with a, a EMI girl singer called Sheen Mulholland. Uh, So I got a call from Eric that day. They said, um, I've got a song I want you to sing. I said, okay, you know, tomorrow, day after. And he said, no, tonight. Uh, I didn't The realize same day, tonight, tonight, tonight. Same yeah. day, tonight. And I said, but I don't finish till 10. You know, I'm here all day. <laughs> so um, I, yeah, they didn't send me a limo or anything. I got on a bus and the tube and, and then I walked half a mile to Abbey Road Studios, got there. After the, after my session, and uh, uh, Eric got on the piano, played me a bit of this song. I said, uh, "Okay, so you know, can I hear the backing track and stuff like that?" Which sounded amazing. I so wanted to sing that song. Uh, so they said, "Well, go learn the song." So I went downstairs to Abbey Road, between the canteen and the toilet, put the cans on, and listened for half an hour. Uh, had the lyric sheet in front of me and I said, okay, I'm ready. So I said, so uh, the only thing I did is say, they said, what do you think of the track? I said, it's amazing. I said, the, the rhythm section and the, you know, the sound is just incredible. I didn't know who Alan Parsons was, you know. Really? You didn't know uh, who he was? No. No, I didn't. Thank God. Thank God. Because if I knew who he was, it'd be like, you know, Quincy Jones or something. You know? That's right, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I wasn't nervous. I knew Eric and he made me very welcome and Alan was fine, you know, they made me a cup of tea and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so I came up and they said, what do you feel? And I said, yeah, I think I can do a good job, you know, because I was quite confident, you know, I'd been in Gonzales and I did gigs and yeah. stuff, but I'm still quite young. Yeah. So, uh, okay. so what do you think? I said, well, the guy singing the demo, it doesn't sound very good to me. It's a bit lame because the rhythm section just kicks ass. You know what I mean? That's right. I think I can I can perform on top of it. Yeah. And I thought I'd lost the gig then because the button got pressed and Eric Wilson said to me, Oi, uh, I sang the demo. <laughs> so, <God>. <laughs> me. <laughs> so, oh no shit, I've blown this one. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was I went, oh, okay, but I knew Eric as a friend, you know what I mean? So I said, sure. oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't, you know, I, didn't okay. know I, was, I was digging a hole, you know what I mean? That's so, right. uh, okay, was, well, in fact, Eric said, okay, big mouth, see what you can do. That's right, uh, try to do better than I can. <laughs> I nailed, I nailed, I nailed the song on the first take. My right? God, man. And they heard it, and they went, yeah. I mean, Alan was kind of, he doesn't get very excited, he went, fine. You know, Eric was looking and they're both looking at each other in the studio. Uh, and I said, okay, can I give me another pass? Because I think I can do a better second verse. Because you know I mean? yeah. I'm usually a better second singer. 
So uh, I did that and they went, it's done, right? So I said, no, 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 no. I, give me one more pass because there's some stuff I want to end at the end, you know. At the end, yeah, yeah. I would I'm to do a bit of ad lib and the falsetto, the high That's, that's, that's so right, I said, yeah. I just want, because it's, it's fading and it needs, I need to be on the fade somewhere, you know what I mean? I just felt I need to do something. Yeah. So I did that and they said, okay, that's all I heard, okay. And no clapping, no nothing. And go have a cup of tea. So I went downstairs and then Alan did a bit of a kind of ADT thing with the voice because in those days you had to kind of run it alongside more than press a button and fix it. And uh, I got a call to come up and listen to it about half an hour, 40 minutes later. And uh, they played played me the track. And I, my exact my reaction was, who the f is that? And they said, that's you. you know? Really? Who the hell is that kind of thing? But with the with the F word thrown in. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't recognize my voice, you know what I mean? Because he, he, he'd ADT'd it and kind of um, um, put his fairy dust on it, as you know. He was brilliant at that. that uh, he was a brilliant engineer anyway. Uh, so yeah, and, and it was done. So uh, they offered me 50 pounds initially to do the track. So in those days, my mortgage was 33 pound a month. So I'm thinking, I got two months mortgage right now. <laughs> I can come back tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I can go home and I can do, the wife can take the kids to school. I'm sleeping in, you know, I've done my job. <laughs> so, That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they gave me a little more, which was lovely. And um, so I went home and then they put me in a taxi at about one or two in the morning. And I went home. And that was, yeah. I wouldn't want to be, like, I wouldn't want to be like you on the iRobot album. Oh my God, man. That was. <laughs> I'm, I mean, you're, you know, that's an uh, unbelievable experience, man. And uh, I, I uh, still love listening to that song. I still yeah. love listening to that song. Yeah. That's great. You knew at the time that Eric Wilson had a, a, a great voice as well, or, or, or you, you knew that from as a friend going to see Gonzalez, you didn't know how, how good he was. No, um, I mean, Eric didn't, Eric had a, his voice would tell a great story. Um, I mean, it's been documented that Alan didn't like Eric's voice initially. Really? Um, uh, you know, not in the sense that he would be tell the world, but Eric Eric didn't necessarily like singing when he first started, because if you look at the first few albums, he's not on the first few albums. That's right, yeah. Uh, and then later... Uh, I mean, so many of the songs uh, suited his voice. You know, they just were made for him. You know, so the ballads and uh, uh, certainly "Eye in the Sky" and um, what was it? "Time" was beautiful. I, I mean, I started. I did a version of "Time," which I love. I love the song. Uh, so, um, and then we we jokingly, you know, if Eric went into the studio. And we go. I'll see you guys in two days because he would he would push Eric, you know, and push Eric and push Eric. So Alan got an amazing job, you know, done with with Eric's voice uh, mm -hmm. because I I don't think I mean I know Eric was in bands and stuff, uh, which I I hadn't really heard, but, but uh, smaller bands in Scotland and stuff. But uh, he, he he didn't see himself as a singer. He just saw himself as the creator and the writer, you know, and and rightly so. Yeah. But uh, later he grew in. He grew into the great into the job, that, right? Yeah. Into the he job. he uh, he died very young, right? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, he yeah. was unbelievable. Man. I mean, I I like the three of you with you know yourself and Eric and John John Miles uh, were yeah the we had, yeah. Of Alan Parsons, You know, it's yeah we had different voices, but yeah, uh, yeah I regret I never uh, having you know perform live. Say with with Eric and then my voice and someone like John Mars. Also, Chris Rainbow was just unbelievable. Chris Rainbow, yeah. The layers, yeah. the layers and layers. So he would have definitely been one. Um, to, he His sound was part of the Alan Parsons projects, you know, with the vocals and stuff. Yeah. Together yeah. with the, uh, the, you know, the band and Andrew Powell and stuff, the the sounds that they created, you know, was brilliant. So I think, personally, if, if there had been... Uh, Eric on leads with me and uh, John Miles, that would have been amazing. 
And every now and then we'd have, we would have invited Colin Blundstone because he was that good. <laughs> it's just the money. How can we pay these guys? <laughs> that's right. That's right. How you get? And, and, <laughs> in, the, in the first two three years or whatever, you guys other parts of where they were selling records, but you were not touring, right? It wasn't a touring band. Well, we're, you couldn't tell because well, uh, it was hard because Arista didn't know how to promote the band because. Alan wouldn't be performing in the band, you know what I mean? So right. he would be he would be mixing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there, I think there were lots of discussions with the record company. Uh, I was I was privy to one or two of them about the shows and how we should do it. Uh, not how we should do it, nothing to do with me, because it was Eric and Alan's baby. But uh, there was a definite time where we would have benefited from being on the road because, you know, at that point we had, we had an established audience um and that would move on to finding new audiences as well you know yeah uh, and then when the records come out because if you're not supporting the records with live shows eventually you're probably going to lose your audience you know that's right um, but yeah but we did um we did antwerp yeah uh, that was something yeah. like sixty thousand people amazing uh with the you know the uh european orchestra there i forget the name uh and but um and then but even then Alan mainly was mixing the show you know from um, inside the auditorium um, and that night there uh, the band um, was uh, I think Davy Payton on bass uh, Ian Benson on guitar yeah myself Stuart Elliott and then the Cottrell brothers Richard and Lawrence uh, and I think um, well I think I don't know I think. Uh, uh, Gary Brooker came on and sang a duet with me on "Don't Don't Answer Me." Yeah. Uh, wow. yeah. So, uh, um, and I think if my memory is correct, on the last night, uh, Alan came up in the encore and stuff, you know. But uh, it would have been great to to have Alan on that show with us, you know, for the three nights. But his the sound that he got that night was more more important, you know. And then so we were his band basically, you know. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, you yeah. got on uh, any. And oh, by the way, Eric was there that night. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. He came and it, it felt weird because he was sitting in the audience and I'm thinking, I sang Eye in the Sky that night. And he he gave me the, the nod to do it. You know, he didn't object that I sang it. So I thank him for that. But uh, he was sitting there in the audience and I'm, I'm singing his song, you know, the one he sang and wrote. Yeah. Eye in the Sky is a very difficult song to. To sing, I mean, it's that it's, range down the bottom. The range, you go a wide range, is is very difficult. You know, even if you're a good singer like yourself, still very difficult. Yeah, no. you know, many people cannot do it. You know, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, they didn't give me any extra for singing it. <laughs> we should have. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I, I, I was I really did. nervous singing it. Really nervous singing it because really the other songs that I sang, I'd recorded them, so they're in my muscle memory. You know. When you're right. singing Eye in the Sky, or if you're singing, say, Old and Wise and other things that I do now. Yeah. Um, but uh, at the time, I was really nervous because that, that early note when, you know, you come in after the big the big crash chord and the, and the keyboard's coming nice and low and pff, you've got to pitch right, otherwise you're in trouble. That's right, yeah. It, you can't receive any royalty I mean, when, when they, they pay you 50 pounds to do that. I wouldn't want to be like you. You got any any in the contract? Or you have like a contract where you know if you reach top ten in this country or sell a two billion record in England, Germany, you get a little money because it, I last night right I look at Spotify and that track had been streamed twenty eight million times. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, no, the answer is no. No. <laughs> Yeah. It was the way it, it was the way it was in those days. You know? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it would have been. I think uh, we got bonuses if it went platinum in America or something. Yeah. but none of that was life changing. You know, it was uh, what it was, uh, and it's it's hard to to fight it after the event. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, and you get it's a mix of do you fight it or do you enjoy the fact that you you had the privilege of singing on it, yeah. you know, because you, 
And sometimes you can do that and it can change your life. Uh, That's if, right. If, yeah. if people allow you to do it. Uh, and other times, I, I know friends of mine that have got very bitter about stuff and they were chasing it and trying to, you know, do stuff. And in the end, um, it, it it's not worth it's not worth the hassle. Yeah. So, but you, but you, but after after singing the track, you you knew that you got the gig. I mean, you knew that eventually they will tour and they wouldn't be replacing you. So you knew that was it would pay no, off in the road, right? Yeah. No. Not really, not really, because we weren't touring. So how would you know? You know. How would you know? Yeah. You would just get the call. I mean, uh, I think you mentioned in, in one of the things about stereotomy or something. Um, one of your questions as yeah, to why yeah. I wasn't on. Um, I think at the time, maybe uh, uh, I was asking Eric for a better deal, um, you know, and um, so I wasn't, either the songs didn't suit me, which I doubt because the, the fans and the record label would want you on on the, the, the songs because we were the established people on on uh, the musicians on the yeah. projects um uh because i i thought you know yeah i i did think it was a little unfair that there was nothing else because we weren't touring uh, if i'm honest uh, uh we got the little bonuses uh, if if it went like i said platinum in the states or something but uh, i remember asking because I, i felt i was maybe rightly or wrongly i don't know but I was an integral part of the Alan Parsons projects, you know. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And and so was Andrew Powell and Poss and Ian Benson's guitar solos are incredible. You know, I mean, when we do shows, the audience sing you the parts. You know, if if we ever get a guitarist to play those songs, the the reality is that the audience will sing, will sing that that melody. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. Another guitarist wouldn't have played that melody, so those melodies were Ian Benson's, you know. So the band were exceptional, and some of those guys are still playing, and they are. Um, so yeah, I felt I was. Uh, I mean, the way Eric made me feel, because I was pretty close to Eric, uh, and uh, that I was some integral part of the band, because uh, I used to do interviews for them and we went to South America together, you know, Ian, myself, Alan and Eric. So you kind of feel you're part of that structure, uh, mm -hmm. the way you're treated. And Arista Records used to call me up regularly for interviews, which I did willingly. Uh, so at that point, yeah, I felt I wanted, I'd like a little more because I felt, you know, I was part of something. Uh, yeah, you're good too. And so... Yeah, my contributions, yeah. But um so when Stereophonics came out, I wasn't I wasn't asked to do it. So it could have been that, or it could have been uh the songs the, the song in their opinion didn't didn't suit me. I don't know. But uh so then I thought it was over, but then they asked me to ask me back for the one after. So yeah. And then you, and in between, you end up releasing your own record, right? your first record, solo record, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, because so, it's strange, isn't it? So maybe there wasn't a song there for me on Stereophonics because yeah. at the same time, Eric still loved my voice and he got us, he got me a deal with A&M, which I was very grateful for. And a lot of the guys in, in that, the band, came on and played, uh, you know, Stuart was on drums. John Gibbon was actually a bass player in Gonzales, so, but he later went to do some work with Alan on other stuff. Uh, but at the time, um, and I had Max Middleton on keyboards and Robert Awai on guitar, and they were fantastic players. Uh, so the, the rhythm section was a mix. And Alan, uh, was commissioned by Eric to produce it, which was a great sounding album. I love the album. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, and I got signed to the American A and M. Uh, but in some ways, I wish I'd been signed to the British A and M because the British A and M had uh, were kicking America with the British artists because they had Squeeze, they had Joe Jackson, they had uh, Joan Armatrading, they had. <laughs> 
police, police. The police, of course. You know, still... <laughs> you know with stinging, stinging there. So they yeah. were kicking ass um, in America, and right. I got signed in. I, I got signed in America, not in Great Britain. In, in the UK, in wow, that's very, very <laughs> weird. Because yeah. so. when I walked, I, when I walked to the A and M, it, it came the King's Road. They didn't know who I was. And I said, I, I lived down the road. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it was a strange signing. But the record was great. The record was great. Uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, that time we went to the south of France and recorded it out there with Alan. It was a lovely, lovely part of my life. Great experience. Yeah. What what memory do you have of, um, you know, turn on a friendly car? I think it might have been one of the best you know, uh, Alan Parson albums and uh, you end up singing, uh, you know, games people play and I don't want to go home. What 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 do you recall from that period? Well, actually, normally we would, when we did the stuff, it was the singers and the, the rhythm section would go in and record the stuff with, with Eric and Alan <clears throat> and then singers would come and go. So sometimes you'd meet, I'd meet Chris Rainbow a lot because we would sometimes do on Games People Play, we did the backing vocals together. Yeah. <clears throat> and if Eric and Alan thought that there were other songs that needed my voice in something, you know, Chris and myself, I'm not sure if I did that many. But uh, then uh, uh, I believe game, the Turn of Friendly Card was recorded in Paris. Yeah. Uh, because I get mixed up as to where we recorded which one. So we did a lot at Abbey Road. Uh, so the nice thing was Chris and myself went to Paris and we were actually there 10 days. So we spent 10, 10 days or more uh, with Eric and Alan as well, you know, whereas normally you'd come in the studio. Sometimes I just, if I was in town I'd, and they were recording, I'd go in and say hi. And, you know, Colin Bunstone might have been doing a vocal or somebody else you know might be might have been singing something or there'd be a guitar overdub going on and i'd have a cup of tea and say hi uh, uh, and other times so when i went to paris we were there for for 10, ten days uh and uh, I recorded my songs and and so chris and myself became very close uh closer uh we lived in a, a little hotel and we'd walk walk down the Champs elysees down to the studio um probably about a mile and a half you know catching the shops having a coffee and all that kind of stuff uh, but yeah and then at night um obviously eric alan and chris and myself would go out to dinner every night so um i'm not sure if we saw any shows i don't think we did but we certainly discovered uh french vietnamese food which was exquisite Good for <laughs> was, you man for the you. best, the best, the best. And I, I, things I remember, you know, forty years later. Um, wow. There's a few other stories I can't, I can't tell on uh, YouTube. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, um, Chris, yeah, we, the four of us, you know, became kind of like brothers, you know, in in that time because normally yeah. we didn't spend that much time. Obviously, we did spend a little time when we went to South America. Uh, uh, but that time, you know, we just used to go to the studio and hang. And Alan was working on other stuff or mixing it or doing whatever he was doing. And we would just sit in. Uh, and then certain days, two or three days were, were our, our tracks that we did. And sometimes if Chris was doing harmonies, uh, if Chris ever did harmonies, we'd all go out to, to lunch and leave him in the studio. That's it was a, the best gig you could have, you know. Alan would have the the uh, assistant engineer record record uh, and we just go out you know because <laughs> chris was such a professional and we come back and go okay play us the 48 tracks of vocals you know what i mean that's right and, wow a sea of excellence yeah you know? it was wonderful wonderful yeah. so uh so uh, as soon as chris walked in we'd all go look at each other and go so where are we going to dinner <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> my my understanding is that um um, when you tour in Argentina and Brazil uh, for the turn of Friends Car, you 
you enjoy that very much. I will I will send you. I have something that you don't know I have. I will send you an email with some some stuff and uh, uh, some magazines and stuff like that that some friends send me. Uh, okay. You, I, I I heard that you 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 really like it uh, there and you have a great time. I I wasn't aware of the political situation in Argentina. When oh I got yeah, there. yeah, Argentina, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I we invited the airline people that we traveled there and a whole bunch of people yeah. we had friends that we met on a plane and yeah we had this big uh steakhouse in argentina we were having fantastic and there was like of course. 100 100 meters of uh, fire with the steaks on it you know uh, or probably less than 100 meters but anyway we were having a fantastic evening i don't drink but everybody thought the next day that I had been drinking because I stood up on the table and started dancing, you know, dancing, dancing and stamping my feet. And and I didn't realize that the president of Argentina was in the restaurant at the same time. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, and there was this kind of moment, you know, like in that the sort of the big mafia movies where there's a silence and everybody looks to see if the boss is going to clap or smile. You know what I mean? That's and right. Apparently, yeah. apparently, he he didn't mind. So there was a. <sighs> yeah. Sure. But I was I was young, just high on life. You know what I mean? No, um, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, Going back to Alan Parsons, is, is there any particular reason that you didn't participate in the Stereotonomy Stereotonomy album? Or. Well, no, I said that before. I didn't. Maybe it was because I was looking. If I'm honest, maybe I was looking for a better deal, but there was no animosity because yeah. maybe there wasn't songs for me or maybe I was looking for a better situation and they decided, not they, I don't know who would have made that decision. I can't really tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as I know, I, you know, Alan uh, would, I I never gave any problems recording. I just used to go and then perform the yeah, song yeah. because I love yeah. singing, I love singing those songs. Um, and Alan was happy to, you know, record and guide and stuff. So um, I don't know. I yeah, maybe maybe the the tracks weren't suited to me. I, but I wouldn't have thought so. But it was just strange coincidence that yeah. I'd ask ask for you know, a better day. It you day. know, as a as a consumer, right, as a listener of music, um, all the all the um, Alan Parson, you know, albums are very good, but. It's it's weird to me how Eric or Alan can they have so many singers and then in a particular album they may have okay you you I only want you to send you know track three and seven and you two and five and it, I don't know how the, I don't know how you need to be very skillful to make the decision because you yeah. have a, a great voice. That you could be applied to all the track, you know. Eric have a great voice. I could have applied to all the track. I, sure. you know, I don't know why how they make the decision. Yeah, there, yeah, there's some track that are are harder, like Eye in the Sky, that not not many people can do that, right? Uh, because they have a, like a wide range. But the majority, you could have done a lot more. I know you did twelve lead vocals, which are the best, right? So. Yeah, no, uh, I I don't know the the reasons. I mean, if you if you look at uh, Las Familia with Elton with um, John Miles, yeah, that's yeah. tough. That's a tough song. Uh, yeah, you know, and John had that sort of almost operatic feel to it. Right. And then if you look at say Cycle Babble, you know, it's got that hard edge. Yeah. And yeah, possibly I could have. I don't know if I could have reached. John was in a higher range than me. I could, you know, I could get up there, but uh, I I would tend to after I wouldn't want to be like you. Whether it was the the record label or Eric and and Alan, uh, they would kind of give me the high energy songs. You know what I mean? Uh, that was yeah. maybe slightly soulful. Uh, yeah, I'd have loved to have sung a ballad because. <laughs> In the gig now, when I do, uh, I love singing old and wise, and I love singing time, and I hit the note in time right, right at the end, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I love singing it. So yes, I could have, you know, um, yeah. 
on things like Silence and I, which is more lower key. But Eric, Eric has lovely tones down, Absolutely, down yeah. that area. So, um, yeah, in retrospect, they, you know, when you look back, you could think, yeah, I could have done this, that, and the other. But uh, yeah. I'm, a, I was happy uh, with the songs I got because, as it turned out, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be a key was a uh, you know, top top twenty track, and so was well, games. And not only that, but if I look at the list of the twelve lead vocal, you have games people play. I wouldn't want to be like you. Damn, if I do too late, I don't want to go home. Step by step, vulture culture. Let me go home. One more rider. You lie down with dogs. You want to yeah. get your finger burns, and you don't believe me. Those are. If you look at any list on Spotify, you are right there, man. I mean, it's and I yeah. and I did I did the math. All this, all this song, if I add all of them, have one sum. Well, Game People Play have 22 million. The I wouldn't want to be like you, it's 28 million. All of them are over 64 million stream on Spotify. Um, it's unbelievable. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Uh, you yeah. Know, how I how mean, many I... people can put that in on, on the rest of it, you know? <laughs> my, on my CV. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Sally Wilson actually very generously created on Spotify uh, Lenny's Lenny's architect track list as well. Yeah, yeah. If oh. you go, uh, I don't have it on me, but <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it was it was lovely of her to do that. So, uh, uh, yeah, listen, I'm 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 proud of you know my achievements with the Alan Barnes projects. Uh, I I just wish we had toured as as a band. You know, yeah. uh, as the as Alan is doing now, yeah. uh, uh, I had uh, said, you know, if uh, he ever wanted me, I'd I'd sing there in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. but it, it's what it is. You know, that this pointless yeah. trying to figure out why and why we're not doing it, etc. Because I always thought that if if we went out with uh, <laughs> the original recording guys you know with with alan i think this we could be on bigger stages you know for sure uh, yeah but it wasn't to be so yeah. yeah i think alan is slowing down a little bit he's only doing uh he's doing i think only two gigs one in one in a, no two in november and then nothing until next year i don't you know so yeah, yeah he had a big back operation uh, yeah but yeah something yeah I uh, wish him well. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, we're all listen. We're all getting older. What, <laughs> what's you know? What's the problem? <laughs> In fact, it, you know, a reunion gig would be amazing. But so, I, 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 if I interview Alan Parson, likely that I will. I will hopefully. I will mention yeah. that to him. I listen, will. we could. Yeah, we could we could do it in a church somewhere so that if we pass away, they can just move us on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 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 eighty six, you were part of the band The Immortal with John Deacon, yeah, a great admirer of Gonzalez at the time. So uh, you recorded the song No Turning Back. Feel free to elaborate on that one as well. Well, actually, sadly, there's not a lot to elaborate because I was uh, Robert Dewey, the guitarist in in. Um, Gonzalez um, was a friend of John's, a big friend of John's. Yeah. And they went to they went to college together. That's oh, how they okay. met. Yeah. And uh, so uh, John was a great admirer of Gonzalez. So we, I just got this call from Robert and said, you know, a bit like the Eric Wilson call. We've got this song, and John would like you to sing it. And I went, John who? And he went, John Deacon. And I went, I'm there. You know. So uh, I can't even remember if if I got paid because it was just one of those moments in life where you think, you know, the base where a queen just gave you a call. So, uh, um, but I did think that we would go on to do some other stuff because the track was great and it was on a movie as well. That's right. Uh, it was yeah. supposed, to be the, supposed to be the soundtrack for Beagles. Uh, but I think John Anderson was also doing some stuff and there was some political usual, you know, management stuff that was going on about, who gets positioned where they do. So we went to the the Royal Command performance of the movie with uh, Charles and Diana were, you know, were wow. attending red carpet. Uh, obviously, John got chosen to meet them. Uh, 
he was waving to us, you know, from, <laughs> and we were, we were waving back. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, what about us? You know, anyway, yeah, what about us? Yeah, the rest yeah, it was fun. Uh, and that was the first time I saw John in his superstar and stages, because before that, he was just a lovely guy, you know, he still is, really. Uh, so he was, a. Uh, so uh, we did a, the video on the Queen set, you know, um, that they used to rehearse on. Um, I think it was at uh, Pinewood Studios where they made movies and stuff. So um, that was a great experience. Uh, but, you know, I went into a studio, recorded it, and that was the first time I met. I'd seen John before at gigs, but not to talk to too much because he's just, he was very quiet. He'd stand in the back, listen to the band, and then go home, you know. He didn't hang hang around uh, backstage and After all that kind gig, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't that kind of a guy. But, you know, I got to know him reasonably well. And then on the day of the uh, the video, we obviously were there the whole day recording. And I had the privilege of meeting Peter Cushing, the Dracula actor. <laughs> so he's on the, um, he's in, in the video as well. Uh, yeah. But I, um, with my grandkids, it's great because I've seen the, the video of the, the track, the song, uh, while the track's going on, you know, there's me singing it and John playing bass and with Robert and stuff. Um, and then there's a scene where there's a helicopter because I've got these this leather hat on with the scarf, you know. And I've convinced the grandkids that I'm the guy on the helicopter jumping off the helicopter Before into you, the wall. So they think I'm I'm Superman, you know. It's yeah. amazing. Before <laughs> you, man. In 89, you, you released your second solo album, a small but hard. I think it, do you only released that in Japan. Is there any particular reason why you? It was a yeah. It was a funny deal. Um, I got there was a guy that wanted to invest in. And he came out of Paris and he was in wanted to invest to to make money, you know, from the music industry. And they chose me. Uh, so. He came up with quite a big budget in an advance and all the rest of it. But the catch was, I thought, wow, thank you, you know, because I wasn't doing a lot then. And, you know, if an investor comes along and says, choose your studio, choose your musicians. You do it. Go. You yeah. know? So I'm thinking, you know, do I give Alan Parsons a call or do I give Quincy Jones a call? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but... Um, it turned out that the guy that was investing, I can't mention his name because of because of the story I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Uh, the guy that was investing had these songs that he'd written and he wanted me to sing them. Oh. And, the, and the songs weren't very good, but the money was nice. You know, <laughs> what so, do you do, the money or? <laughs> you know, your reputation and blah, blah, yeah. blah. So I managed to get put a great band together and I got uh, Kuma Harada, the, the bass player of Gonzalez, who was also with the Pretenders, uh, Chrissy Hines. And I think he's now working, he's in the rhythm section with, uh, for Steve Harley. Steve Harley's got New Rebel. <clears throat> he's yep. still playing. Yep. <clears throat> and Kuma always liked my voice and said, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we do this? And what we'll do is we'll just change the songs. Yeah, change it a little bit to make it more suitable for you, right? So The guy can still have the publishing and the writing, he'll look good, he'll look better. Yeah. We'll get in, we've changed some of the titles. We certainly changed the field because everything sounded a bit sort of Arabic and Turkish and it was a bit strange, you know. Um, so we changed everything. I mean, 100% flipped it. Even the lyrics that didn't make sense, you know what I mean, at the time. Um, so, and the album came out okay. Um, the title of the album is a bit weird, but it's... Um, I can't tell you the story because it's children might be listening. Uh, Somebody can sue me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it was a great experience. We went to Jacob's studio, a residency, and had some lovely musicians. You know, Robert was there. Uh, Max Middleton played, and Ian actually Ian Benson was on guitar as well. So it was fun. I loved the experience, um, and I think we made a really good album. Uh, but. Um, um, we were restricted by the writing, you know, on it. Um, so we we all 
I wouldn't say it was a mistake because I enjoyed singing it. Uh, and uh, I, I stretched myself in areas as well, which I hadn't done. So, uh, yeah, I think it was a great experience to do it. Yeah. But it, but it only came out in Japan, like you say. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's weird. that. And then toward the end of the 80s, you, you started working as a manager, a producer, a music publisher. Uh, what, how did you decide to start this role? I mean, you kind of wear off singing, singing a little bit, and you say, well, I know only, I know that many people. What if I stand there, you know, start producing some of the records and promoting well, them? If I'm honest, I got to a point where I wasn't in love with the music industry. Really? You know? uh, yeah. Uh, I was love with, I was in love with singing and performing. Yeah. But I wasn't in love with the corporate, the way the corporations are going. And also I'm thinking... I went through a period where I wasn't making any money. Uh, I had a family to bring up. Of course. Uh, and uh, I was disappointed in the people I'd worked with because, you know, records that I was performing on and singing on were making a lot of money. And uh, so there was no royalties in there. And <clears throat> even the Gonzalez thing, the, the deal was... I think it was like 6% between 13 guys. And by the time the record company finished recouping and recouping in which they, you know, I'm not an accountant, you know what I mean? I'm a musician. So if you try and chase that and prove to a record company that they were falsely accounting and blah, blah, blah. So it's just too, too expensive to do. And so I went, you know what? Um, I've loved what I'm doing, but I don't... I don't see myself performing again. I was not in love with the, the business of the music industry. So sure. I walked away, but then I thought, and I sort of did a few strange jobs, try to open up a couple of businesses and, you know, as you do. Uh, but really, I wasn't qualified to do all that. Uh, and she even thought if I work in a record store or something, you know, because I'd be close to vinyl. So I did a bit of that with a, you know, video video plays with records and stuff. Didn't enjoy it. And then I start. I opened a studio um, in uh, Clink Street in in uh, East London, uh, London Bridge, and it was actually Clink means prison, and they were yeah. the the prisons under the, under the ground that they oh, really? created studios. They had created studios from yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was called Clink Studios, and. Uh, I opened a company with a friend of mine and we, the, my plan was to have rehearsal rooms so that you could see the bands first. And if you like the bands, you sign the bands, record the bands and publish the band. So that was the whole idea. Yeah. So I did that for uh, about two years and we found a couple of nice artists that we got records released, you know, from people. Uh, Unfortunately, my partner uh, wasn't, uh, he was my best man as well and godfather to my daughter. Uh, he, um, well, basically he kind of ripped me off. So, uh, and the whole thing crashed, you know? So I had to, I had to get out of that business pretty fast. Yeah. Um, but it was a, a lesson in life. I mean, you couldn't go to college for that, you know, the, the things that happened. You learn, uh, right? Yeah. You learn, yeah. And basically... I was kind of left with the bill while he he disappeared with the money kind of thing. So uh, uh, so it's nothing to do with music, but apart from that, so I kind of that that burnt me a little, uh, but it kind of made me stronger to actually be in the music industry back. You know, not necessarily singing, but I thought I've got I know so many people. Uh, my knowledge of having success in the soul soul part of the music industry and the rock part of the music industry. Uh, you know, and I had a lot of, a lot of people were kind of, uh, there was a lot of love out there for me at the time, you know, to, to help. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, I kind of got into management and uh, this man, Dickley, he took me under his wing. He sort of mentored me a bit and I had, I used to go up to his offices and uh, he would kind of help me. And I, I got a deal signed with Phonogram with a band called Seventh Heaven did quite well um and then 
the Japanese thing came along after me establishing myself as a manager. I was the manager, a publisher, and a producer at the time. Um, and they had a meeting with me uh, through a Japanese interpreter. And um, the first meeting was six hours, and the second meeting was nine hours. <laughs> I was exhausted. I felt like somebody just sucked it out. You know what I mean? And I thought, they asked me how I would help break a Japanese rock star into the you know the West sort of yeah. thing. So I gave them everything I knew about how we would do it. And there were other people in contention, big names uh, that wanted the management deal. Uh, but they, after about four or five weeks, I got a call and saying, it was from Japan and it said, uh, Lenny-san, what are you doing Friday? And I went, feeding the dog. That's <laughs> right, nothing. <laughs> watch, your, watch your football. Yeah. They said, you come Tokyo, quick. I went, okay, we sent ticket. So I went and I saw Hute, Tomoyasu Hute perform to about, I think it was Yokohama Stadium and uh, to thousands of people. And I actually got it. When I, when I heard him live, I got, I got what I needed to do. So we started a business um, in, in, in London. And uh, that business lasted 12 years. And over that period, I helped produce about 30, 30 albums, 36 albums, and, but mainly managed Tamayasu Ute and uh, got him to the uh, closing ceremony, ceremony of the Atlanta Olympics. He played on there, which is a big deal. Of course. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I did, um, we managed to, there was a great, great music experience that we did for the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima. Yeah. Uh, that's been, uh, and on that, I got him playing with, uh, like, he did his own spot, but he was also in a, in a kind of house band with um, Ian's drummer uh, and Wicks Wigan on, on, on guitar, Phil Palmer. Phil Palmer on guitar, Wicks Wiggins was playing keyboards. Uh, so Wicks was in with the Wings band and stuff. So, uh, um, and, um, I also sang myself that night with Joni Mitchell, um, doing yeah. backing vocals for Joni. Uh, and managed to get Hote to come and play guitar. So uh, on the same track. So we, and, and Sir George Martin was the musical director. So, uh, you know, and that night there was, <clears throat> Dil, Bob Dylan was on the show, Bon Jovi was on the show, uh, et cetera, you know. So, so yeah, I've done some, pretty nice things in my life that, you know, but it, that came about because then I was managing um, and I just met Joni on the bus. We were going to the rehearsal. We were the last two on the bus. And she mentioned that there weren't any singers. They were the singers like the Bon Jovi's and Dylan, but there was no other singers that she could call on. And when I told her my name, she knew my name from somewhere. So I said, well, I did a bit of, I did a little singing in a little band called the Album <laughs> <laughs> And then I had a kind of hit with Gonzalez and I know you. Um, apparently I reminded I reminded her of uh, somebody that she went out with many years ago, you know. So uh, we started chatting on the bus and then next minute I get a call saying, would you sing Sex Kills with Johnny? So I said, yeah, you know, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> so yeah, it was great. And it's just, I mean, things, I think if you, if you don't say no to things and say yes to everything, sometimes as long as, you know, it isn't crazy, uh, things will happen. And I've, I'm still like that, you know. Yeah. I say yes to everything. <laughs> uh, to what? <laughs> I say yes to everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, you, you don't want to live, live your life and look back and say, man, why I didn't whatever got that job or went out with that lady or son for that son or whatever you you need to the only way you learn you know with the with the successes and failures i mean you need to take chances sometimes uh learning in life yeah. and, and, and and go for it you know it's, uh, that's the only way you know it's, uh, 
And uh, in 2010, you have the your impressive return with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and, um, you know, and uh, the Royal Albert Hall. Well, to commemorate the 50 year of the Beatles, feel free to elaborate on that one. Man, that's, that's a very <laughs> big deal, man. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Yes, it was. And uh, I was lucky to be one of eight people. There were a lot of people on the show. It yeah. was done for the president of Malta. Uh, for children in need uh, in Malta. And I I'd, I already had done a show for MTV in Malta that year. Uh, and um, a friend of mine, Rocco, booked me there. I did a gig uh, with uh, my band, just as, you know, Lenny Sachsek, uh, yeah. Voice of the Artists Project. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there was sort of an affinity with Malta. And then... When this opportunity came up, I mean, she, they had Dame Shirley Bassey and uh, Beverly Knight was there, and there's a guy Tony Orlando who was saying. Uh, uh, so there was some some pretty big artists on, and also you know it was the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' music, so they had it was there was about uh, a few songs were orchestrated, and the rest you know because it's an expensive business having everything orchestrated, but. I got one of the songs with the with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, come together right now. Uh, I still don't know the lyrics, and I don't understand the lyric because <laughs> I think the Beatles were stoned when they wrote it. But <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I had a fantastic time. Yeah. Um, but the thing was, you know, when you go when you go into rehearsals, like it's you got literally three minutes in your rehearsal with the orchestra because it's too expensive you know what i mean so you had to learn you had to learn your part and you know in the and if you ad libbing something there's no there's no room for change you know what i mean that's right yeah uh, um so i remember going in and i was my rehearsal was just before shirley bassey's i mm. mean she's a diva you know and fantastic um so of course i finished and i, I said the end there. I wouldn't mind holding this note if you could just hang on, you know, for X bars and then end for the orchestra. And as I was talking, Shirley Bassey walked in and everything just stopped. <laughs> and I had to leave. Um, and um, I still held on to the note that night and hoped that the orchestra would hang on, but they, they, they ended the song before I finished it, which is fine. But I loved it. I mean, it's funny. I thought I'd be really, really nervous doing the Royal Abbott Hall. Um, and it was like 5,000 in that night. And uh, I, as I went, as I, I was nervous, nervous, nervous walking in all day. And, but when I walked on stage, just everything disappeared. Everything. I felt I was in my front room. I really did. I just thought, wow, this is cool. And the orchestra is playing and I'm looking at the audience and saying something. I'm thinking, you're about, <laughs> it's being televised and you're about to sing, you know, to 5,000 people orchestra get your act together but it just came up i just sang it naturally and yeah. i can't remember why i lost i lost uh, my inhibitions but i just everything i wasn't nervous as soon as i stepped yeah. on stage backstage i was a basket case yeah uh, as soon as i walked on i wanted it you know you, you, a couple of minutes ago you say well i got lucky i don't think luck can take you some places a little bit a couple of times in life. The rest is is quality and experience. I mean, Alan Parsons is not lucky to be who he is, or David Minassian, or Andy Latimer, and so on, so many great musicians there. You're good at what you do. You're very humble, though. Um, well, Lenny, you know, I mean, I, when, I, when I'm in rehearsal and stuff, I, I kind of, I'm demanding in that sense, but yeah. not in a... Uh, I actually admire... If I'm working with a great musician and he's 26 years old, uh, I I respect him straight away. I don't go and thinking. Uh, by the way, I'm I'm better. In, I'm better. Or I'm 70 and I know you know I know, I know stuff. Uh, so that's why even my band are a lot younger. They just have to be great musicians and love yeah. love the music and love what we do. You know. So I've always yeah. been that, uh, and I still listen to you know the younger generation and stuff. You know, uh, there's some good stuff out there, you know. So, yeah. In 2019, you the band, the project was formed, and then 
tell as much as you can tell without. <laughs> well, I was happy and I was, <laughs> yeah, I was happy and I was sad really because mm. the we rehearsed almost for a month. Yeah, you know, we had pre pre rehearsals uh, at Richard Cottle's studio and. Various members of the band were coming in and out. To we had to audition for another singer to handle some of the different tones of the you know of the, the project songs. Uh, Andrew Powell was involved at the time as well, but then uh, as we got close to the gig, he he got ill, uh, so he couldn't conduct the orchestra, which was sad. Uh, but um, yeah, the gig in Barcelona was amazing. I mean, uh, I know why now these, I mean, these guys playing, I mean, Richard was phenomenal on keyboards. Uh, Lawrence was amazing on bass. The drummer just, stood there, he just sits in the groove. I mean, nothing moves. He just sits in the groove, you know, it's fantastic. And, uh, and then we got Dave Bainbridge, we auditioned Dave, but we just knew of him through YouTube and stuff, you know, of this pro guitarist. And it was actually Davey Payton in Scotland that I met him. And he said, if you're going to get a guitarist for the project band, obviously yeah. Ian is ill, uh, yeah. not very well. So this guy, he has his own style. And funny enough, as he, we were rehearsing with him and stuff, that year he became fourth best pro guitarist in the world and then last year apparently he's second best pro guitarist That's in the right. world yeah. Yeah. so we said we you know we won't pay him any more money till he becomes number one pro guitarist that's right <laughs> and you get a bonus you know so okay. dave Brange is a sweet guy oh uh, yeah 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 he, he also thinks he can sing backing vocals since i've talked to him now with well, our personal joke <laughs> so uh, he wants to be the number one backing vocalist as well which i think he will be uh, and then we have Sam Blue, who sings uh, beautifully. He's got an edge to his voice, you know, very rocky, which I, which I love. So it's a good contrast with me. So we, and then we re rehearsed 10 days as a band in, in Bristol and then went out and got there. It was the longest day of our lives because we rehearsed with the band because we wanted to hear what it sounded like on that stage. Sure. So we went through the whole whole. 90 minute show uh which took probably three hours because we were stopping and starting and then then when we thought it's done we had to then rehearse with the orchestra because it was the new orchestra with a, a new conductor so uh uh there were some legal issues uh which didn't help yep. uh but uh, the court in spain decided that we could do the show so mm -hmm. we did uh and uh yeah, we have a, a recording of it, which we, we shall release in 23. Uh, and hopefully we will be touring in 23 with the project band. Yeah. You will so, release that as a Blu-ray, as a CD, or? Yeah, we'll release uh, probably vinyl. Vinyl, oh, that would be yeah. even better, right? Yeah. yeah, I think we want to release vinyl first. Uh, and then there is, a, there is a video which looks spectacular, but, uh, you know, as usual, there'll be some sort of issues that we have to deal with but we're yeah. we're not really built for that we're just musicians you know, so yeah. we no, I mean so i interview bainbridge i interview uh david payton very good people very decent people yeah. very exactly. nice to get exactly. along yeah. unbelievable you know it's, uh, very good I'm, I'm glad to you you work with it and then a few years ago you end up releasing your a new album called love letters love letters uh, there was a there's a very beautiful uh love song there and uh Feel free to elaborate on the criteria for selecting song for the particular album. It's very, very, I really liked it. Thank you. I, well, it was Steve Jeffries, who uh, is in a band called Latin Quarter and also reasonably, reasonably famous uh, for their music. And they still tour. Steve, I used to do gigs with, I used to do private parties and stuff, you know, with the Gonzalez stuff with backing tracks. And then I use Steve on keyboards and a saxophone player, Bud Beetle, uh, who's an amazing player, plays flutes as well. So uh, we were just doing this stuff, and, and Steve said to me, no, Steve sent me the Buddy Guy album. And I heard it, and, and I was just inspired by that album. And Steve said to me, why aren't you doing this? And I went, I don't know, maybe 
I'm not sure, you know, that I want to go back and sing that to that level. I don't know if I can sing at that level. Uh, so he said, well, why don't we just, he said, I've heard you sing, you know, soul tracks and everything else when we do our private parties, you know, because we did about 20, 30 shows that night, that year, you know. And he said, hey, you still got edgy, you still, you still got a voice. I said, but I don't believe I have that voice in me left, you know what I mean? Because uh, it's like, you know, is Messi going to be a good player anymore? You know what I mean? Or Ronaldo, not that I'm as great as them, but, yeah. you know, you, you're in a belief. You have to believe that you, you got it and that you're not kidding yourself because, you know, I can make an album and play it to my wife and she says, oh, that's wonderful. But the the media and the, the sharks out there, <laughs> yeah. the radio stations, they're not sharks. But mm. So I'm thinking... He said, listen, let's, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I've always had these songs in, that I always wanted to sing, that some of my, my parents used to sing to each other, like yeah. love letters and stuff, and sure. and others that I've always thought, can I do not a better version, but an equal version sure. to that song that Bonnie Raitt did, for example, you know, which is one I did on the album. Things like that. And... Uh, so he said, well, the only way we're going to find out is get in the studio. So, That's right. Um, so I Can Make You Love Me was never recorded in the studio. We recorded that for YouTube. That's live. Really? That yeah. is live. And that's on that album. And all we did was clean up the mess, you know, the, the shuffles and somebody walking into the studio while we're singing it. And the, there was a camera guy moving around, you know, with this little camera. And the funny thing is, if you hear the end of that song, I'm singing it, and I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking, for Christ's sake, Steve, give me a chord that I can end this song on. And because he's still playing, and I'm ad-libbing, and he's still playing. And if you hear that song, we both end the song perfectly, right? Yeah. And to this day, we have never, ever ended that song the same way, because we can never get it right. Because it wow. just happened. It was that moment where... Yeah. I felt it, he played it, and it was like, boom, you know, when we finished it. Because we yeah. did three takes live, and the first take, in some ways, was better, but the camera was, no, the camera was, no, the first take wasn't great, but the camera was all over the place. And then when the camera wasn't great, we did the best vocal take and playing take, and that is on the album. So that was our first attempt, and after that, my confidence grew. And then fooled around and fell in love and stuff like that. I, I just loved the song and I loved the the the, the story because every person by the time they get to your age or my age has fooled around and then fallen in love, right? <laughs> so, I, I got a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, uh, and yeah, I just loved. And I, but I did say one thing to him. I mean, we did that in a, in a, in a shed in the garden, right? And we called it Riddle Riddle Sound Studios in oh. Steve's. House. And then I got guys to come in. Uh, Tim Cansfield played on it. And that year he was playing with Barry Gibb. He did uh, Glastonbury. He's playing with Barry Gibb. He was playing with Dexter and the Midnight Runners doing the show. And he came into the studio with us and he said, I, I don't know which song I'm playing for which band right now. He's because he was in three bands at the time. But he's a brilliant player, it's Tim Cansfield. And uh, he was in Gonzales years ago. So he played a bit. I've got Robert Hawaii's son playing bass. And um, um, James, a brilliant uh, bass player. He's doing well now. Uh, we got some of the Gonzalez horn section to come in and play it. And then uh, Ian Benson played a little bit on Love Letters. Um, and uh, he, although he was ill at the time, he just loved, he said, no, I'll do it, you know. Uh, so he played a bit on it. And the, the only thing I insisted with uh, the, on the production was that I had my voice exposed because I wanted, you know, I didn't want it hidden behind layers and layers of reverbs and tuning and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud and honored to have done done the song. And Steve did a great job for me. Good for you, man. You you are like a good bottle of wine, man. You're getting better and more refined over time, man. And I don't drink, so I, don't, I know I, I know my wife drinks. So I understand. Right. I, I understand. You don't drink at all. Nothing. No no beer and wine. Nothing. Not, not, not. No. 
No, yeah. nothing. Well, good for you, man. Yeah, yeah. What are you working nowadays, man? What are, What is in your... What are you doing next week, the week after? What are, What's on your uh, plate now? <laughs> well, um, I'm, I was supposed to be going to Florida to do uh, a soul show in January. January uh, yeah. Because I was going over and, and doing stuff for Legends of Vinyl. Um, I was sort of honored in the Hall of Fame out there yeah. um, in New York. So I, I do I want to keep that alive, doing the sort of Gonzalez things. But yeah. uh, the, the main objective now is to to launch the project band, really. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we were supposed to be uh, when are you when will you put this interview out, do you think? Uh by tomorrow we'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Oh Jesus. Okay. So oh, uh tonight, yeah, no, no. tonight ten. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh yeah, there was a possibility of, of going to South America in, in November. Yeah, you mentioned, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it hasn't really been confirmed as such. Uh, and the for, it was a guy in Chile, funny enough, that was going to get us out there. Uh, but I, I think um, for whatever restrictions or whatever, we at the moment it, it's not confirmed. But uh, we're kind of working on that initially. Uh, I'd like to. I would like to go out and make another album actually, uh, because I feel that uh, you, you know, still have I it. I don't know how long my voice is going to last, uh, so no. um, I hope God's going to be good to me because I don't smoke and I don't drink, so that's kept me kept kept my voice young. I still yeah. sing all my songs in the same keys as I did thirty five forty years ago, so I'm happy to do that. Uh, so yeah, I still have a passion to. Sure. to get out on the road. I love, love singing live. I just love going out there and performing. So Good that's what you. I want to do. Yeah. Man, I hope you guys can overcome all the legal difficulties with the project and work something out. And Me too. You know, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how this stuff works. I just... I like to listen to good music, you know? That's all That's all I do. And yeah. uh, I hope you guys can think work, can work that out and, and then being able to travel and... Uh, and and do well, man. You 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 you're a very good guy, man. Thank you. You're you're a very yeah. humble and uh, good personality, good guy. You you still you just have an unbelievable voice, man. And as I say before, you know, with all the you have done well in your life with Al Parson and all the other bands, you you with Gonzalez, um, Johnny Mitchell, and you know all the other men yeah. people that you have worked with. So good for you, man. Yeah. Hopefully, Thank I will you. be able to meet you one day, and if you ever. I go to London often, at least two, two to three times a year. So we'll get okay, together. Okay, well, come, come see me. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I went, uh, this year I went twice. I, I went to see Eric Clapton a couple of times, Royal Albert Hall. I went to see the last three shows of uh, Genesis when wow. they retired. So okay. I went to the, so I, I go those two or three times a year. As, uh, so we need to get together, man, for dinner, well, you know. Yeah. For, if you come to Europe uh, and we're gigging, it's, there's yeah. got to be a VIP ticket for you somewhere. Think, think, or, <laughs> or with the project, or if you are ever in DC, we need to get together. That would be nice. And, yeah, we'll just have dinner. Yeah. yeah. It was very nice talking to you. Then you are a great guy, and hopefully, things will work out with the project, man. It was very Appreciate nice talking to you. Take it Thank easy. You, man. Sure. Thank no you. God bless. Bye bye.